Hey, I'm Jeff Collins with NASA Environmental Management Branch, and we are happy to be here today to talk about the NASA Indian River Lagoon um, Health Initiative Plan. And Dwayne, very happy that you could, could finally be here. Um, and I say we because I have some people here uh, with me, or maybe I'm with them, starting with Laura Aguiar, with whom you met, Nick Murdoch, uh, Chief of Environmental Management Branch, and Don Dankert, team lead of um, our environmental planning group um, within the environmental management branch. And so anytime, you know, we have a break or after the meeting, you can hit us up with, with questions if you have questions about things that are going on. And I'll move around so you can see. Um, and I'm especially excited to be presenting because in 17 years with the Corps of Engineers, I was always the most hated person in the room. <laughs> and so, I, and I might be overstating, I mean, at least some people were probably ambivalent, but uh, that's, a, that's a tough job. So hopefully we can do better than that today. And so we're going to talk about the Lagoon Plan, and it's a, it's a brief uh, presentation, and we're going to look at some funding and kind of talk about how NASA structured just to, so you can kind of have the full set of information to go with the plan. I think I've talked to, mentioned this to a few people, the, it, you know, the ironers, irony is never lost on me, um, the fact that Kennedy Space Center, you know, had some, some pretty significant environmental impacts when it was constructed. Anybody can go online and figure that out. I think a uh, for the crawler way and pad 39A, I think it's about 350 acres of fill in the, in the lagoon, you know, and that's what they did back in the late 50s, early 60s. But out of that arose the 135,000 acre um, Merritt Island National Refuge, Minwar, as we call them, because that's a lot to say. So if I can say Minwar, you'll know what I'm talking about. And we've been working with them for a long time. And we coordinate with them pretty much on, day, you know, on a daily basis. They are our land manager, and they manage all areas outside of operational areas at Kennedy Space Center. And not to shortchange uh, Canaveral National Seashore, CNS, you know, we, we work with them too. They just don't manage quite as much adjacent to our operational areas. But uh, both those agencies kind of have their own things that they're doing, doing for the lagoon as well. But we collaborate on a lot of activities. So things to come. Right now we have about 5,000 acres in operational areas. Uh, based on the 2015 master plan, that will expand to about 7,500 acres of development with the, what we call the multi-user spaceport. And that sounds like a lot, but you know if you break it down, it's about 16.5% of the Kennedy Space Center upland areas, about 8% of the uplands and wetlands, or about 5.5% of the overall 140,000 acre boundary. So at the end of the day, you know, we still have 100, over 132,000 acres of conservation. So it's a good deal, especially considering the rest of, you know, the way the, the rest of the watershed was, was built out early on through stormwater. And we've done environmental monitoring out there for a long time and we continue those efforts. And it really occurs in, in three main areas that guides the environmental monitoring. Regulatory compliance, operations, and stakeholders support. And we do a lot of work that benefits state stakeholders with our two primary stakeholders here being Minwar and CNS. Okay. And looking at environmental monitoring, you know, all this work is performed by contractors and the way we're structured is environmental management branch manages a portion of that and environmental assurance branch eab manages a portion of that um, emb you can see the list there it's a pretty eclectic list really for, for one group sustainability energy historic cultural resources nepa uh, ecological monitoring and i highlight ecological monitoring because that's really the work we've done in the past for ecological monitoring is the kind of the backbone of the Indian River Lagoon Plan. And then Environmental Assurance Branch, they deal with what I call the hard environmental, the, the environmental permitting, the compliant, regulatory compliance and remediation. And they, they uh, manage water quality issues, so they're, they're part of the plan as well. Next. 
So going back to 1983, you know, burrowing down into the ecological monitoring, um, we started ecological monitoring, and which culminated with uh, end of shuttle and what Don likes to call the end of shuttle report. And that was in 2014. And I don't think you can read those names, but you no doubt know a lot of those people and have worked with those people. And um, many of you went to school together. Uh, a few people, NASA paid for people to get PhDs. And so that work went on a long time. So now all that work is uh, Ecological monitoring is conducted under what we affectionately call NIMCON. Again, you know, like Corps of Engineers, NASA has a lot of acronyms just because, just because you need them. Um, so the history of monitoring, we don't, I don't have a full suite of monitoring up there, but you know, there's a lot of biological monitoring, carbon sequestration, um, different things NASA has monitored over the years and is still monitoring most of that. And so an example of uh, regulatory compliance, you know, Florida Scrub Jay, there's biological opinion, you know, compliance issues. We monitor for that. You've heard of Dave uh, Brininger before, I'm sure. He does a lot of that work along with others. And um, that would also be a, a stakeholder-driven uh, monitoring as well, because we deal with memoir as they prescribe burn, and we deal with uh, Scrub Jays. And launch impacts, obviously operational issues, and um, again, stakeholders, maybe uh, scrub vegetation, we pass on some information to, to Minwar regarding scrub, how it's responding to fires, and you know, they hopefully use that to their benefit. Next. So moving on, kind of getting into the plan now. Uh, I credit Don, he won't want credit, but I credit him with the idea of the lagoon plan and over two years ago talking with some people you know they decided that they need to move forward with that and so Don started that and I actually uh, trying to move around to get out of Hannah's way uh, I actually came on to NASA and, and took it up with the contractor and we actually put the plan together and it's really needed I, I give NASA credit for, for putting this together, you know, NASA is a special place with the refuge and with property on three different bodies of water that comprise the Indian River Lagoon and being on a barrier island. So um, what we proposed when we embarked on this really were what I call actionable projects, projects that we could actually implement, not bite off too much. There are projects such as, you know, putting culverts under the crawler way that, you know, if we, if we went down that road, we'd still be talking about that and we wouldn't have an IRL plan, a, a lagoon plan. So we stayed away from those big ticket items. And um, funding, always an issue. Uh, the ecological monitoring funded under NIMCON is, you know, we have funding for a lot of those activities. Some of the other items where we have to do studies and design and construction, we have to go find that funding and we've got people you know, that do that. So looking at the, you know, the, the various actions, whether it's monitoring restoration or collaboration, it's all geared towards informing management of the center, whether it be operational areas or areas outside in the, in the operational bud, uh, buffer, or may, maybe even further than that, a little, more, a little more regionally, potentially. And so I call the plan a living document. If you don't like that, uh, I mean, look at it this way, it's not a static document. We don't know everything that needs to be in the plan. There are some studies proposed that will give more information, and as we get that information, we'll put additional uh, either studies or design construction elements into the project or into the plan. For example, I know one area right now that we could pull down a buffer and talking with Menoir and improve circulation in the northern Banana River Lagoon. So something like that that we've identified since the plan was written, you know, we'll we'll pull that stuff in. And certainly as the public has input and, and stakeholders, you know, there might be additional things that go in there. And we did coordinate with stakeholders very early on with uh, the beginnings of the plan in terms of Minwar, CNS, uh, the Space Force, talked with the Space Force and, 
and uh, Fish and Wildlife Commission. They all had input early on into this plan. All right, Kathy? Okay. So getting down into the details of the plan, the items in green are things that are funded. Items in red are not funded. We're looking for funding. And so proposed monitoring actions. Shoreline resiliency is a big thing for NASA. Um, over the last 20 years, I think the mean annual uh, water levels come up about a half a foot. That's significant not only for the dune that protects pads 39A and B, but also uh, for the lagoon. And that has implications for the lagoon, not just NASA. And you'll see some pictures on that uh, in a minute. Um, and it's not cheap. You know, we spent, I think, $26 million over the last five or six years maintaining three and a half miles of dune. So there's significant dollars that go into some of these projects. Spoil islands, we've got a lot of spoil islands up in the Mosquito Lagoon. Again, you know, ironic that historically they were impacts, now they're a benefit to uh, horseshoe crab, shorebirds, uh, whether they're foraging or nesting, potentially. Uh, depends what's on the, on the spoil islands. So we're gonna take a look at that and see if there can be benefits provided to the lagoon from doing some work on those. Horseshoe crabs, fairly important. Again, that intersects with shoreline resiliency. Um, as we lose shoreline, we need to protect infrastructure. We don't want to be dumping a bunch of rocks on the shoreline um, if we have key spawning areas for horseshoe crab. And so we're going to take a look at that. And that's funded. And then sport fish monitoring. This is some of the best work. Um, did Doug Scheidt make it in here today? Who's not here? Well, he has the second best job in the world. Eric Ryer has the best job in the world. Um, dealing with sport fish monitoring and what we call the FACT array, the FACT network. And that's the Florida Atlantic Coastal Telemetry Network. It's a series of acoustic um, receivers out in the Atlantic, and in this case, the Indian River Lagoon. And you put an acoustic tag in fish, and they swim around, and you learn information about their daily, seasonal, and spawning movements. In this case, with the receivers that we have, uh, and this is published work I provided to, I think I provided to Kathy and Virginia Barker. Um, we had these NASA secure areas. Nobody fishes in those areas, uh, except occasionally Eric Ryer will hook and line fish to put it, tags in them because you can't, but you can't harpoon them. You don't want to snag them, so you've got to catch them hook and line. And what we found is that those operations, that secure area is very important to the lagoon in terms of protecting large brood fish. They spend a lot of time in there. And then they immigrate out of those areas to spawn to help repopulate the rest of the lagoon with fish. So hugely important. Um, some of the important future initiatives, surface water runoff, nutrient inventory, things like that, they're not funded currently. We're looking for funding for that. Um, and that's some of the meat of the plan, right? Anything with water quality is hugely important. No seagrass to map, groundwater and fire projects, that's interesting to me because I know in some places where work has been done looking at um, fire and groundwater relationships, they've seen increased phosphate in the groundwater. Um, then more does a lot of prescribed burning for the, uh, all the scrub jay families that we have at the center. And so we thought we might take a look at that if we could, if, if funding is available. Or we might just monitor the ditch outfalls and see what the nutrient levels are and uh, deal with that. And then Diamondback Terrapin is, that, is another opportunity for monitoring there. Um, you can see a big school of black drum there that we saw a couple of weeks ago. That's up in that secure area right up here. And uh, one last thing to point out is the turning basin right by the VAB building is a nursery ground for, for pup bull sharks. Small bull, bull sharks go in there and they grow up and, and then leave. So that's some interesting information we wouldn't know if we weren't doing this kind of monitoring. Okay, next. So this is our the meat and potatoes of what our ecological monitoring folks do, and they're some of the best. And again, again, you know them. Uh, seagrasses, monitoring since 1983. Doug has a great data set looking at seagrass. You can see it's on hard times. You can also see how it relates to manatee, no seagrass, uh, fewer manatee, and there's fewer than that now, actually. 
Uh, we are, we have up our aerial manatee surveys to twice a month in support of stakeholders, you know, looking forward to what the winter brings for manatee. And uh, wading bird surveys going on since 1987. I mentioned the FACT network, potentially a creel survey uh, for memoir. We're engaged in IRL science and policy, right? We're here. Uh, Doug goes to the STEM meeting. There are other groups that we participate in. And then you can see the other things below that I've talked about, except for sea turtles. We don't know if there's any juvenile turtles in the Banana River or some other areas, uh, Mosquito Lagoon, Indian River. So we might do some sampling just to see what's there. Um, so that's some upcoming work. Next. Proposed restoration actions. We have one funded study that's finishing up in the southwest part of the center, uh, looking at a potential regional stormwater pond. There's no dollars for design or construction, but uh, EAB, Environmental Assurance Branch, is completing that study. Living shorelines, you know, we've tried before to do work with the zoo, for example, Brevard Zoo on living shorelines. It's, it's a challenge uh, as we collaborate because there are restrictions on the type of dollars and you have to have agreements and these sort of things. And so that's never worked out, but we are doing our own. Um, you can see Audubon Road south of Cars Park, some of the damage to infrastructure to the road and to communication lines in there, and that's in the lagoon. And we'll be putting in a small revetment, very short revetment, with a way break, with some uh, soil in between. And hopefully that will attract more sediment so that we at least generate some shoreline there. We'd rather not do big, hard revetments to protect, protect uh, infrastructure in the lagoon. So we're trying to do better than that. And then this is a small project we did on Cars. Cars Park was a big, Revetment. You can see it from 528. Um, you know, I liken it to the cliffs of Dover if you're looking at it from 528. Uh, it can stand out. But we did a smaller area, a small way break with some plantings. That's fared very well. And you can see some drift algae. Actually, that's Calerpa there. And I'll talk about that in a minute. That's a component of the plant as well. Um, Future dredging, yeah, can we do dredging better to pull nutrients out of the effluent as it goes back into the lagoon? We're, we're looking at those kind of things, shellfish, the super clams. Um, we didn't get any, but Minwar got a hold of some, or they're getting a hold of some, so they initiated that work, and that's really good stuff because that's super important to restoration of the lagoon and keeping the, the lagoon healthy. Uh, septic tanks, I think we have about 40 septic tanks on center. They're the 500 gallon variety, so they're not huge. Um, there's the opportunity potentially in the future to take a look at those. Do you put them, you know, put them on the sewer line or do you uh, put some advanced denitrification, you know, on the system as you do updates? So we'll look at that next. Um, collaborations, I mentioned collaborations. It's more of a challenge now based on things that have happened uh, in the past for collaborations. We're held, held to a pretty high standard with agreements and where a collaborator's funding comes from. We do pretty good with universities, um, so that's good. Uh, Brevard Zoo and Aquarium support. We are not designing the aquarium. I think that an article might have said that uh, yesterday. We are having some input. Eric Ryer is our uh, participant in that, he meets with the zoo and he gives input periodically on some of his expertise with his work with the fishery. So that's funded. Um, future initiatives, we're talk we talked about an Erlon station up in the North uh, Banana River. You know, there's not a whole lot of data for up there in terms of water quality. So that would be something important to make happen. Muck flux, we've got borrow areas just like everybody else. You know, we'll take a look at that. Shoreline organic matter, again, intersecting with shoreline resiliency. Um, we've seen a lot of shoreline loss, and when it, and it's not just hurricanes, the water's high enough now when we have, you know, late September, October, high water events and an easterly wind, we get this black water condition. I call it black water. It works for me. Um, and it really comes from spoding soils and maybe some organic soils that are exposed. 
And so these shoreline projects, again, are important. But what happens is the terrestrial vegetation and even mangroves that are ripped out of there get ground up, you know, a big part of that stays in the lagoon, and then these coffee grind looking remains are tossed back up on the shoreline. And so that either accrues as muck, or maybe it ends up in, in, in the lagoon, and eventually, you know, some of that is more dissolved organic carbon. Either way, it's probably not good, and so um, we'd like to take a look at that. Sea, sea turtles, we are going to sample. Potentially, we could do some gender studies and you know, the sex determination form and also genetics. That would be a collaborative action. Uh, dolphins, uh, aragonite, calcium carbonate. Uh, we all have heard about, in this meeting, actually, in, about coastal acidification. So that could be something that we collaborate on the in the future on. Um, and again, the collaboration is important. It brings an expertise that we don't necessarily have and allows us to work with stakeholders to do more in the lagoon. Uh, mercury, NADP sites, drift algae projects. You saw the algae before, uh, similarly to the, to the organics there. Um, a lot of, not all, but a lot of NASA KSC shoreline is accessible because we have impoundment firms. You know, could you, could you go around, uh, not necessarily with a vacuum truck, but something smaller, get some of that material off the shoreline, um, and as we work towards getting this tipping point back to a functional lagoon. I realize it's mostly water, but every little bit helps. <clears throat> HAB study with alligators. We are not studying alligators per se. We had a 13-year program where we captured alligators, took a bunch of samples, um, gave them to researchers, and we did some life history work for alligators at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, again, that was over a 13-year period. We've got about 760 plus or minus samples left from that work that started in 2010, about when the blooms, uh, we started having problems. So we're working to maybe do some work on those samples. And then eDNA. Um, NASA does not have an eDNA program. Again, we collaborate with others, and the extent of our collaboration thus far has been to take researchers out on a boat, let them collect their samples in places that maybe they can't get to. And we'll see, I don't, you know, perhaps there's more to expound on with that. Um, so we'll see what, what comes in the future with that. And let's see, what's next? Oh, we're there already. Um, the Lagoon Plan is available on our National Technical Report website. There's also a lot of other stuff on there, a lot of other reports. You can go in there and search uh, by subject, by author's name, uh, by uh, title, if you have a title, and pull up that information. If you have thoughts down the road and you want to share them, you feel free to email me at nasa, jeffrey.s.collins at nasa.gov. And uh, you're able to do that. And with that, if you have any current questions or comments, I guess we can do that pretty quickly. Hi, hi, good morning. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about your carbon sequestration. I know the sea drift is a part of it, but um, whatever elements are you doing in light of, um, are you keeping with international guidelines to try to hold the temps from the greenhouse gas emissions to no higher than 1.5 C? Will it work? We're most recently actually finishing up is in the Spartina Marsh. And um, we have a report on that. I don't know if it's on the NTRS server or not, but uh, definitely we've seen that Spartina marshes do sequester carbon, and that's the about you know the extent of that study. And we can probably get a report out there if you're looking for more information than that. And of course that does go with sea level rise though, right? And others have been concerned about that as these uh, salt marshes convert to mangrove, you know, what, what happens then to carbon sequestration. So um, we've got some good baseline data on that. Okay. Yes, sir. All right, I really appreciate what you did today in terms of sharing this. This has been kind of a silent area, I think, on the lagoon for, for quite a while. I wonder, do you have any thoughts of maybe doing something like this annually or by letting us know what you're doing? Uh, uh, you know, I, this is really great information. 
Sure. I, I mean, we uh, we can provide updates. We're regular members of this management board, for example. So even if it's just an informal update, um, but we can do a more formal presentation. I don't think Nick would have a problem with that. You know, give me an update every year as we learn more and as as we're doing things. Yes, sir. I have a question on your stormwater system. You talked about that earlier that you were trying to get some funding, and you also mentioned about monitoring the ditches. I was wondering, do you, would you have to do, do, do something to do on that? Because it seems to me that those stormwater outfalls would be contributing to the uh, uh, interpretation of things like you're doing in the area. Yeah, so NASA does have quite a bit of stormwater treatment, actually. But even ditches, even ditches that were there when NASA got there, you know, there was there was agriculture there before NASA arrived on the scene. Some of those ditches are, are still there. I mean, frankly, anything that gets water to the lagoon faster is adding to the nutrient load. I mean, we, we know how ditches work. Um, and so even natural areas have some you know, nutrient discharge. We also have hogs that work those areas. Uh, they're right down there in the wetlands in the transition zone. So, uh, yeah, that's something that we'll be taking a look at. One other question. I noticed you didn't, you didn't mention anything about invasive species. What's going on with that? Are there cases or anything like that, like in South Florida where we have a python or any report? Uh, I would say we probably have two, and I'll, I'll let, if, if, if anybody else wants to weigh in, but the two we manage for are feral hogs. There's anywhere, I don't know, three to 5,000 out there. And again, you can think about it, it's the equivalent of a couple of cattle feedlots right there where they forage into wetlands. It's not just that they're eating natural things and then putting it back into the environment and into the environment, they're destabilizing soils. They're right there in the wetlands, in the transitional areas. And that, you know, that could actually be a significant part of uh, lagoon issues. So Menoir manages for that and um, we have cattail for mitigation sites. We manage for some of that. And then I don't think anybody's found an answer for Brazilian pepper. If you do, you're probably a millionaire by now. Um, but on those alkaline soils where there was historic agriculture, you know, we got pretty dense Brazilian pepper. So to answer the question, pretty much hogs is, I, I think, what we manage for. All right. Hey, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. More slowly. <laughs> One more. So, um, well, the my grandparents had a house on Patton Creek, and it was paradise for us when we were little children. So I remember what you know what the water was like out there, and the oysters were lying in the shores and everything. And we were pretty unhappy when they had to move. Then they went to, um, they bought a house south of Mesquite Lagoon. Again, paradise. Um, and they had to move from there too. So then they gave up and moved to town. So we were pretty unhappy for a while. But I'm, I'm really glad that NASA is out there and that we have this fabulous um, wildlife refuge in Canaveral National Seashore as a result. And I was really, really happy. I went through the whole report, really happy to see everything that that you've got in the report, and, and I hope that you find funding to, to keep moving on everything. And I like to count horseshoe crabs, and we have a lot of really good horseshoe crab volunteers here working with FWC, so if you want us to come out and count horseshoe crabs, we'll do it. But my question is about um, the stormwater, uh, how you can deal with stormwater on the thousands of, of acres of new development that you're proposing. Um, um, do you plan to use low impact development strategies try to keep the rainwater in the ground where it falls, so it's a, certainly you're not going to add more fresh water to the ditches and, and uh, impacts than, than what's already happening. Well, I can tell you this, that current development standards, and I know um, these are presumptive standards, but we have to uh, provide 50% additional treatment above the St. John's requirement. So there is additional stormwater treatment. I think when you're dealing with launch complexes and those sort of things, it's maybe a little harder to talk about, uh, you know, green facilities. But for NASA facilities, you know, we do have those kind of discussions. We we evaluate everything. If if 
uh, for NASA and tenants. You know, if you want to put a hole in the ground, you go through a process through our environmental um, and through site planning, and, and we look at those issues. Uh, to your other point about horseshoe crabs, we, we can talk about that. Again, NASA, we're looking at it a little differently, and I'd be interested to hear your input on horseshoe crabs because we're looking for management information, not necessarily to do quantitative studies. And I saw a picture of you counting horseshoe crabs <laughs> somewhere. Um, and so we're, we're looking to find out what the good beaches are. And so we need to cover a lot of ground rather than drill down to one specific beach, uh, like on the causeway and, and, and count there. So our initial starting point is water the important areas so we can identify them and, and uh, protect those areas. And if you have any thoughts on that, you can catch me later. Okay, thank you.